So this is third Sunday of review, and we are all the way up to chapter 9. That seems a little loud. Okay, so, and what was chapter 8 about? Okay, once we got past the woman caught in adultery, what was chapter 8 about? It is probably, if you're going to do apologetics on the deity of Christ, the end of chapter 8 of John is probably one of the most salient go-to verses for Jesus declaring his own deity in as much as he's going to declare his own deity in John. Because we know that he does not come right out in any of Scripture and say, I am God. He never does that. But in John chapter 8, he comes about as close as he ever does in all the Scriptures of saying, I am God. And how does he do that? Right? That was actually earlier. No, in the end of John, just before they pick up stones to stone him, he makes a declarative statement concerning Abraham, and it is right. So he gives a great I am statement, and there are seven I am statements we realize in John, but this is the declaration that before Abraham was, I am. And obviously all the Jews understand exactly what he means by that, even though one of the things that you're going to get if you talk to a Jehovah's Witness or someone who does not believe in the deity of Christ, they make a big point of saying that it actually is, I am who I am in the Old Testament, and so he's not actually equating that um, with Jehovah God, but... Obviously, the people, who he, the people who he is addressing at that time understood categorically what he was meaning, right? They understood that he was saying that I am the Father of one, I am God. Before Abraham was, I am is obviously a, a statement of eternal being, that I don't simply exist at this point in time in front of you, I have always existed. And at the time of Abraham, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced that I existed always. I am. That is the point that he is obviously getting, and they understand, and they pick up stones to stone him. Okay, so then we go on to... He's that he goes out of the temple, and we're not positive about the space and time that goes on after this, but he passes by and he sees a man born blind from birth, and his disciples ask what question? Who sinned? This man or his parents, right? That's what the question is. Is who sinned this man or his parents? And Christ says, Neither, but that the glory of God might be displayed, right? And we went over that last year and we talked about the fact that, you know, good things happen to good people, but also bad things happen to good people. And good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to bad people. And we talked about last year, we talked about the relationship between blessings of God for obedience but also blessings coming through trials. Do you remember any of that? Right, so when we say that, that God always gives us good, all things work out together for good for those who, are, who love God and are called according to His purposes, right? So it doesn't matter whether your dog dies or whether you are given a million dollars all of these things are good from God, right? So we talked about the fact that there is, for the, for the believer, everything is working out for our good. For the unbeliever, everything works out for their condemnation. Right? And how would that be? Well, that's true. 
that we are guaranteed eternal life in Jesus Christ, and an unbeliever is guaranteed eternal death, but what does it mean that everything in your life as a believer is for good, and everything in an unbeliever's life is meant not for good? Right, and that's exactly true. Hendrick is exactly right, is that everything in the unbeliever, when something bad happens in an unbeliever's life, right, do they turn to God? Well, you might say that some of them do. They turn to a God, but they don't turn to God. And if they pray and to God as an unbeliever and God answers their prayer, what difference does that make in their life? It doesn't change their life. They don't go from death to life. They just go on with their life and they're happy that they got out of that bad situation. If, so it doesn't matter if they have a bad situation. It does not conform them to the image of Jesus Christ because there is no light in them. It just heats on condemnation on their head keeps on burning coals on their head because the good God gives them, they're not thankful for. And the evil calamity that God gives them, it makes them more bitter towards God. It makes them not appreciate God. Right? But for the believer, everything that happens in your life is designed by God to conform you to the image of Christ. And so He is constantly shaping you. So everything that happens in a believer's life is moving them towards goodness and is a blessing. And everything that happens in an unbeliever's life moves them towards condemnation. Okay, so we went on and we talked about the fact that the man who was born blind is is healed. How is he healed? What is the methodology by which Christ heals him? But he, he makes mud out of spittle, puts it on his eyes, and sends him to the Pool of Siloam. Now, we talked about this, that the Pool of Siloam is the pool that was made by Hezekiah. It was the pool of water that was used for the celebration of the Feast of, of uh, Booths. Right, So they went to the pool of Siloam and they got the water and poured it out on the base of the altar for the celebration of the Feast of Booths. So this, this story about the man born blind is directly connected to what we've already gone over in the celebration of the Feast of Booths and all that we talked about there. Right, So they are intricately linked in this. Okay, so... The man goes, he washes in the pool, and then what happens? He is brought before the Pharisees for investigation, right? So it took place on the Sabbath. The Pharisees bring the man for investigation because it is said amongst the people that he was born blind, and now he can see, and the healing was done on the Sabbath. And so they, they question him as to the methodology that Jesus has used. And then when they're not satisfied with his answers, they, get, they send for his parents. His parents come and they say, yes, indeed, this is our son, but how he was healed, we have no idea. Uh, he is of age, ask him. And the reason why they say that is why? Right, for fear of the Jews. We've already seen beforehand that people were very careful about what they said about Christ because it was they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Right? Anyone who said that he was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. And so the parents point back to the man. The man is not at all scared of these people. And we know that how? 
He makes fun of them. He gives a sarcastic answer. Well, this is amazing. You guys don't even know where this guy is from, and yet he opens the eyes of one born blind. Why do you ask him? Do you guys want to become his disciples? You know, that's uh, supreme sarcasm. And realistically, we can understand he's just been given sight. Like, he has no fear of these people. He understands that he's been given a gift that only could be given by God. And that's how he sees it. Sees it. No pun intended. Okay, so... <laughs> okay, so... Uh, they say, at one point, they say, so... I had to put my glasses on because I can't see. Kind of also connected. <laughs> Illustration here. Okay, so, for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this that this man is a sinner. What did that tell us about the Pharisees? One, what do they mean by give glory to God? What is that... A, what does that directly point to? What's that? That's true, but they're actually pointing to an, an Old Testament occurrence and an Old Testament understanding of what that meant. There was somebody that that it was directly said to in Joshua. You remember when they came into the promised land and they took Jericho. And they were told to devote the city completely to destruction. And Achan stole. And he hid his pilfered stuff under his tent. Joshua comes to him and says, Give glory to God. In other words... Fess up, you did wrong, give glory to God because He has found you out. Right? That is the implication. And here it is the same implication. All right, fess up, what did this guy do? Give glory to God, sin has occurred here and we know it. And so they say, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. So, we talked about this last time. They are not impartial and objective judges. They are not coming to this situation seeking understanding of what God has done in this situation. They are looking for evidence with which to condemn Christ. That is their whole objective. And they openly display their hand here and say, we know that this man is a sinner. And we are under no illusions. We are not fooled. We know that this guy deserves death. We just need the evidence so that we can have a conviction. Right? So, and then obviously he goes on and gives a sarcastic answer and their answer to him is, you were born in utter sin and would you teach us? So the story begins with who sinned, this man or his parents? And Christ says, neither. The Pharisees, on the other hand, give, you were born in utter sin. So their connection to his blindness was obviously that he was blind because of his own sin. You were born in utter sin. So there is this obvious difference between their understanding of of his blindness and Christ's understanding. Now, we go on and Jesus comes and finds him. And how does that interaction go? Well, yeah, it goes really well. That is absolutely true. So Jesus confronts him and says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answers, And sir, and who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? And Jesus says, You have seen him. And it is he who speaks, he was speaking to you. And he, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Okay, so what we, what we talked about in, in chapter 9 was the comparison 
between chapter 9 and chapter 5. The healing by the pool of Bethesda and the healing of the man born blind. What are some of the similarities between these two? Anybody remember? They both occur on the Sabbath. That's one similarity. The what? But Jesus heals both of them. Yes. What do you mean by both questioned? Oh, yes. Yes, there's an investigation into both of them. The Pharisees uh, talked to the man who was uh, an invalid and they talked to the man born blind. So there's an investigation in both instances. What else? Both healings involve the pool, right? One is the pool of Bethesda where the angel supposedly stirs the water and the one is, involves the pool of Siloam which has to do with the Feast of Booths and the water and, and, and also that the name of the pool is Scent, right? Which we would say is connected to Apostle, right? Oh, yeah. He didn't do anything by accident. <laughs> but anyways, there a reason why. yes, there's a, there's a reason for the healing on the Sabbath that we have to take we have to uh, take out of this. In that one, he is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? And he's always also said, "Do not judge according to appearances, but judge with righteous judgment." Right? He is not breaking the Sabbath. Because he is in keeping with the spirit of the Sabbath, right? That you guys will haul an ox or your donkey out of a ditch, right? It is, is it right to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? Obviously, it's right to do good on the Sabbath. So, if, if I heal on the Sabbath, then that is obviously in keeping with the spirit of the Sabbath. So, yes, he is purposely provoking the situation. He is, because in provoking the situation, he is revealing the character of them, and that will come out in, as, we, as we look at the end of this. But what are the other similarities? Right? So Jesus heals and then beats the feet. Right? Jesus doesn't stick around. He sends a guy to the pool to wash his eyes, and he leaves. He doesn't stick around when he tells the guy, pick up your bed, bed, right, and walk. He doesn't stay around. He leaves. It's not until later he comes and looks for both of them. So there is that connection. The other important connection is, is do either one of them ask to be healed? Neither one of them. This is not people coming out in faith and seeking Christ, as we've seen in a lot of other instances. Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me, right? That is not the case here. These two individuals are just there. One guy is begging, the other guy is begging and, and wants to get help down to the pool, but neither one of them seeks healing. It is not on the basis of their faith that they're healed. And that's very evident. But it is on the basis of the power of Jesus Christ to heal that He heals. It's not at, until afterwards that there is this definitive moment of decision. That the moment that they're healed, it is just, it's all Him. That's really important. Because, and, and, and it's quite possible that this is a... a purpose in John and the Holy Spirit to correct misconceptions that might have arisen from the synoptics. Why would I say that? Because in the synoptics, a lot of the time is Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Right, And it is quite possible that what arose out of that was a false teaching that it is all about your faith that determines whether Jesus has the ability to heal you. And obviously, 
It is not on the basis of your faith that Jesus has the ability to heal you. Jesus has the ability to heal anyone that he chooses to heal at any time, whether they be believers or not believers. He has the power. And it is not you that's the deciding factor of whether he can heal you. But in the synoptics it says things like, and they did not believe, therefore Jesus could not do many healings in that area. You remember that, right? And so by divine purpose, Jesus didn't do many healings there. But that was not a matter of Christ's ability. Christ obviously does not need the person to have faith in order to heal them. The man born blind and the guy by the pool didn't exercise any faith to begin with other than they were obedient when Christ told them to do something afterwards. So the faith came afterwards, <coughs> not beforehand. Okay? How do we know that... What's the other big difference between these two miracles concerning the individuals that were healed? What's that? Well, the guy picked up his bed and walked. Both of them were obedient to Christ's commands. So when you're talking about the, the timing of the faith, uh, what I want to get into is that the faith of the first guy that's healed is not the faith of one who is a Christian. The faith of the second man was the faith of one who believed in Christ. Right? But the decision for both of them comes after the healing. Why do I say that? But the guy who goes down to the river, right? even though he's blind, he was still blind and goes back to the river. So he responded in obedience to go. Well, he actually had mud in his eyes. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I understand what you're saying, is that is that those that obedience was their healing as a result of their obedience? No, but okay. So, would you say that the first guy's faith healed him? Why would we say that? Why would I say that the story? The contrast in the story indicates that the first man did not have real faith in Jesus Christ. No, yeah, neither one of them really know who Christ is. Like, the, the second man understands that it's Jesus, but he doesn't know him. Right? What is the difference between the two? What is the reaction of the first guy when he comes encounters Christ? No, the first guy. The guy at the pool. In chapter 5, the guy at the pool of Bethesda. What is his reaction when Christ finds him in the temple afterwards? He turns him in. Right? Jesus says, Go and sin no more lest something worse happen to you. And the guy's reaction is not to fall down and worship at Christ's feet. The guy's reaction is to go and rat him out to the Pharisees. That's his reaction. And there is this stark contrast between that reaction and the man who was born blind because he falls down at Christ's feet and worships Him. We see that in other healings in the Gospels where... You remember the ten lepers, only one guy comes back out of the ten, and him, a Samaritan, comes back and worships Christ. Right? They're all healed, but only one actually has saving faith. Out of those two guys, only the guy born blind actually has saving faith. Both receive a miracle. Both receive healing. But the guy, when confronted with his sin, goes and rats him out to the Pharisees, the guy who is healed of his blindness goes and worships him. Right? I love you. <laughs> okay. 
So. Oh, you didn't think I was referring to you? <laughs> and you. <laughs> okay, so Jesus heard that he would cast out, and having found him, said, Do you not believe do you believe in the Son of Man? What's the implication there? That this is the decision point. That do you believe in him? And the guy says, uh, and who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? So the implication there is that he does not believe in him yet. But he will. You have seen him. Okay. So, for judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Okay. Jesus said earlier on that I did not come to judge the world. What's this mean that, that uh, for judgment I have come into the world then? Yeah. That he's come to make that dividing line, that separation clear, right? And what does it say in, in John chapter 1? For this is judgment, that light has come into the world, but men loved darkness. Right? And this is it. That those who, who uh, see may become blind and those who do not see may see. Right? Think about this. When a, an animal is nocturnal, what is their reaction to the light? Right? So when you're, when you're in darkness and somebody turns on the light, then you can see. You go, wow, I can see. But for those who love darkness, they don't like the light. When you turn on the light, they go blind. This is the kind of circumstance that we're seeing in this, is that those who love darkness hate the light. They hate for their deeds to be exposed, and when the light comes and shines, they go blind. But for those who are children of God, the light enables them to see. The more light, the better they see. Right? This is the kind of situation that is this. And when Christ comes into, when the light comes into the world, those who are blind suddenly can see. The light comes on for them. But those who are in darkness, they go blind. And this is the case that Jesus said, says, for judgment I have come into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees hearing this near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have guilt. But now you say we see and therefore your guilt remains. What does he mean by that? What's that? Jesus came for sinners. Yes, and all of them are sinners. But what does he mean by, if you were blind, you would have no guilt, but you now you say we see, therefore your guilt remains. Yeah, they're, they are claiming that they have the truth, the light, right? They are claiming that they are the teachers. Those You remember in Romans uh, that it says, you know, you have the Scriptures. You say that you can see. You say, don't steal. You say, don't rob temples. But you're guilty of all these things. So because you are saying these things, you are self-condemning. Because you say you have the law. Well, you do have the law. You have the writings, you have Moses and the prophets, and they speak of me, and yet you've rejected me. Therefore, because you say we see, you are self-condemning. You say, if we had lived at the time of our forefathers, we wouldn't have killed the prophets. Well, then you are testifying against yourself that they killed them and you hid the bodies. Right? You built the tombs for them and hid the bodies of those that your fathers killed. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you are guilty, but the ones who are, say, were blind, the ones who admit their blindness, 
God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Those who fall upon Him are broken, but those upon whom He falls will be utterly destroyed, will be crushed. Right? By admitting that you do not see, you demonstrate the humility and you come to the light. But they say we see, therefore their guilt remains. Okay, we are going to get through chapter 10 because I am not going to do another week of review. (laughs) Just saying. Okay, so then we get into I am the good shepherd. And I am the good shepherd, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way. That man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Who is the door? Christ is the door. What is the door? His righteousness or the law, right? So here's another question. Does the door open for the sheep or for the shepherd? That's right. If you've got a gate that the cow can open, that's a bad gate. <laughs> right? Right. The door is shut to the sheep until when? Until they're with the shepherd. That's the only time that the door opens for the sheep. Is that when they're with the shepherd. The door of the law is closed to everyone except for the shepherd, because he is the only one to whom the, the gatekeeper opens the door. And why? Because he has perfectly kept the law, right? And therefore the law is open to him because he perfectly kept it. So therefore, Christ is the only one worthy to have the door open to him. He is the only one qualified to have the door open to him. Everyone else, to everyone else, that door is shut. Okay, he is the door because he is the perfect character of God. He is the law fulfilled. He is the one who perfectly demonstrates the character both in intrinsically and extrinsically. Right? Internally and externally, he is the fulfillment of the law. Okay, so then what are the difference, what is the attributes of a good shepherd? We talk about this. He's self-sacrificing, right? He lays down his life for the sheep, for his sheep. <laughs> Anyways, so, so obviously a shepherd leads, right? A shepherd protects. And a shepherd provides, right? So he leads them out, and they go out and come in, and he gives them pasture, right? And he protects them. So we talked about the fact that in this, we see that the sheep are individualistic, but not autonomous. What do we mean by that when we went over that last time? Individualistic but not autonomous. Right? That's not what I mean by autonomy, though. Right. Are, we, are the sheep self-governing? No. So, we talked about this last time. Do the sheep come in to the fold of the shepherd on their own? Do they have the right to come and go as they please into the sheepfold. No. Right? If a shepherd lets his animals do what they want, he is a bad shepherd. Right? If he doesn't have control over his sheep, he is a bad shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. So nobody comes into his flock except by his permission, and nobody leaves. Nobody leaves his flock. He is the good shepherd and he loses none. So there is eternal security. Jesus never loses a sheep. If he lost sheep, he would be a bad shepherd. Right? 
So he never loses even one. And not one sheep comes into his flock except by his permission and by his command. That is the only way. So the sheep are not autonomous. The sheep don't make the decisions. The shepherd does. But they are individualistic in that he knows each one of his sheep by name. He knows every one of the saved, of the elect, of the chosen, individually. He doesn't just save a lump of people. He saves you. That's how it works. He knows you. He knows every one of his sheep individually. Wow. Okay. So, moving along. Then we get into this passage that says, The Jews picked up stones against to stone him, and Jesus answered, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which one of them are you stoning me? And Jesus and the Jews answer, it's not for a good work. We are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus says, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God's. What psalm is he referring to? 82. Thank you. <laughs> okay, what is that psalm about? That psalm is about God in his assembly of judges. So he is surrounded. So this particular passage at the Feast of Dedication, which is the dedication of the temple, which is what present-day Jewish festival? Hanukkah, thank you. <laughs> Hanukkah, the festival of lights. Jesus is at the te- in Jerusalem at Hanukkah, and he is saying that you're going to stone me and... Because I say, that because you accuse me of declaring myself as God, which indirectly he does. And he points back to Psalm 82, which is God in the assembly of the judges. And God is condemning the judges for unjust behavior and saying, even though I called you gods, you are going to die like mere men. You are false teachers. You walk around in darkness, right? And therefore, you are condemned. So what Jesus is doing is they have come and said, we are condemning you to death because you claim to be God. And Jesus is, in essence, saying, I am condemning you to death because I am God. That's the irony of this situation. And so, we conclude chapter 10 at a quarter (laughs) two with they are... Jesus has made a definitive statement using Psalm 82 to demonstrate his deity in a roundabout sort of way, and they seek to lay hands on him, and he escapes from their grasp yet again, and he goes across the Jordan to where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remains. And it ends in this passage with a constant theme in John, which is there is division amongst the people and even amongst the Pharisees over him. There is this constant turmoil that exists amongst the people of Israel and amongst the, the Jewish leaders on who he is, and that keeps unstable until the proper time, which is his crucifixion. We're done. And we finish the review. <laughs>